We are jumping back into the Minor Prophets, and we are looking at the book of Amos. The book of Amos, and we're going to look at chapter 7 to begin with. Now, as you turn there, I may not move as much today. Um, yesterday, we went and played indoor soccer with the teenagers, and uh, it, I know I don't look like it at all. But I actually, I actually played soccer in college. Now it wasn't; it's, it was a super small college. Nothing to, to to boast about. My point is, I was at one point in decent shape and could keep up. Um, but after playing soccer, and we, we do it about every year, every year and a half, every year to myself, I think, man, I'm I'm just getting older and older and older, and I feel it the next morning. So if I'm moving a little bit slower today, uh, that's why. There's nothing wrong. I'm just getting old, apparently. I tried to tell my wife that I was getting old, and she just said, you're not old, you're just out of shape. I don't know which one's better, to be honest with you, uh, but one way or another, either I'm getting old or out of shape, probably just a little bit of both, to be honest with you, um, but no, we, we did have a great time yesterday, and it's, it's, it was good for me. Uh, did, a, did a lot of running, amen, and uh, took a lot of running to try to keep up with the teenagers, but uh, we had a great time, and we're going to have a great time now. Uh, as we study this book of Amos together. Let's go ahead and stand if you found your place there in Amos chapter 7 as we stand in reverence reading God's word. Amos chapter 7, verse number 14 and 15 is what we're going to read for our text. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day you've given us and this opportunity I have to stand in front of your people. And I just ask that you just fill me now with your spirit. Help me to say only what you would have me say, nothing more, nothing less. If there's anyone here this afternoon that doesn't know for sure that they're on the way to heaven, we just ask that you just work in their life, convict them, help them to realize they need you and help them get that cell before they leave. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we read right here a little bit about the calling of Amos, and he is telling Amaziah here that he himself uh, was not a prophet before this prophesying time, neither was he the son of a prophet. He, he was not someone who was kind of birthed into this as some of the other prophets were. Uh, he doesn't even, not even called at an early age like other prophets were. Uh, and let's go to the book, or excuse me, the first chapter and the first verse there. So Amos chapter 1, verse number 1. It says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So this book... Uh, specifically the ministry of Amos, it kind of goes well with us studying the book of Obadiah last week because his ministry took place not long after Obadiah's ministry did. And in fact, unlike Obadiah, which we kind of have to guess of where his ministry was, uh, Amos lays it out for us right off the bat. Uh, he mentions King Uzziah of uh, Judah and King Jeroboam of Israel. And that already right off the bat kind of puts us around the 760 to 770 B.C., and then he mentions something saying two years before the earthquake. Uh, and there's archaeological evidence detailing that a great earthquake did shake the region uh, in 760 B.C. So it's very likely that this exact verse and the, the verses coming after it was written in 762 B.C. It lines up perfectly with the kings, and then it makes sense with the two years before the earthquake. Now, I do want to point out really quickly, if you remember from my first week, uh, when we kind of introduced the minor prophets, I talked about a king, Jeroboam, the leader of the Israelites, or the northern kingdom, and how he helped rebel against the southern kingdom and King Rehoboam. And we see another Jeroboam mentioned here, but of course this one it specifically says this Jeroboam is the son of Joash. So this is a different Jeroboam, and in fact other places he is known as Jeroboam the second. All right, He is not the same Jeroboam as the one who rebelled against Rehoboam, all right? Uh, save your spot here. We're going to come back in just a second. Uh, but I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 14 right quick. 
to show us kind of what's going on in Israel at this time. Now, uh, if you know anything about Israeli history, if you remember from me talking about the first Sunday that we were here, the northern kingdom of Israel fell in 722 B.C., and they fell to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom fell finally in 586. Now, there were several other sieges and even the taking away of captives before that, but the final burning and, and, and basically just it being absolutely razed to the ground uh, took place in 586 B.C. for the southern kingdom to the Babylonians, all right? So we are roughly about 40 years or so before the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, is going to be taken over. And we see detailed in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23, it says this, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. And again, remember, Samaria is often what Israel or the northern kingdom is referred to as well. And reigned 41 years. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, which the northern kings typically did. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. This is the first Jeroboam who led the Israelites in, Re in rebellion against Rehoboam, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath -hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under the heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. And you say, what in the world is going on here? Let me explain really quickly. Jeroboam here, Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, he is not a good king, all right? But God, in his long-suffering and mercy, he actually does bless the Israelites here. And in fact, it very clearly tells us that the land was expanded during this time. They took over land around them. So in spite of uh, Jeroboam's sin and really Israel's sin as a whole, God still chose to bless them. Now, God doesn't always do that, but sometimes he does. And we should be thankful for that, amen? Because if God chose to bless us purely on our own merits... We wouldn't give very many blessings, amen? So I'm thankful that oftentimes God blesses in spite of what we do, all right? But with all that being said, even though God does bless them, this doesn't mean that consequences aren't coming for them, all right? And I want to mention that. We, I think we often get things so mixed up in our Christian life when we think if things are going great, that means we're doing great. And things are going bad, that means we're doing bad. That's not the way it works. And Pastor preached a great message on that uh, about a month ago now, that sometimes God is good to us to try to bring us back to repentance. Uh, and sometimes God allows us to go through trials even when we're doing everything right. You think about the life of Job. Job, the Bible can't say enough good things about him, really. Uh, my favorite thing is it says he escheweth evil, right? He, he basically tried to run away and get as far away from evil and avoid as much as possible and yet God allowed him to go through some pretty terrible things. So we do have to remember that just because things are great in our life and we are being blessed, it doesn't mean that we're doing everything right. Or when things sometimes go wrong, it doesn't mean that we've done something wrong to deserve it. All right? So I do want to point that out because God here is choosing to bless Israel uh, instead of punishing them right off the bat, which he very well could have done because, again, it said Jeroboam was evil. And he led the Israelites to do evil things. We'll get more on that in just a second. Now, if we go back to the book of Amos, Amos himself is an interesting one. Uh, as you turn, I'll give you a little details about him. He describes himself in our text as a herdsman, all right? Uh, Ralph the Bat, we see that this guy, uh, he's not someone who's a prophet from his youth. God calls him a prophet, uh, likely as an adult, or at least a, we could say a young man, after he's already established himself as a herdsman. On top of that, he mentioned that he would gather from the sycamore trees. Uh, there's some evidence, some scholars believe that Amos may have been a wealthy man just because some of the wording and stuff like that, how much of, of, of it comes with the herdsmen, sycamore trees, and all these things. But regardless, he was definitely a well-established uh, layman, but God calls him to do some great things, all right? Uh, we could say he was maybe the first lay preacher, maybe, that we know about in the Bible. Uh, but he didn't attend to school the prophets. His father was not a prophet before him. And, and 
when we look at the book of Amos, he dives into a lot of stuff, all right? If you've never read the book of Amos, which I hope that you have, um, I hope that you've read the Bible through at some point in your life. Um, I always hesitate saying, oh, you need to get on a reading program where you read the Bible during a year or something like that. Because I think sometimes that can become too much of a habit to where you're not actually getting something from God's word. Uh, but I will encourage you, you should read the Bible through. I don't have to put time constraints on it, all right? Uh, but you should read the Bible through. Every, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for us, amen? And so I do think you should read the Bible through. I think it's really interesting if you read the Bible through chronologically. I can really open your eyes to some different things if you do it in a chronological manner rather than the manner that we have it today uh, the way the way the canon is formed and such, all right? But Amos right here, he goes on a lot of different things. He prophesies against a bunch of different nations in the first couple of chapters. Uh, but I'm not going to focus on that because the primary focus of Amos's ministry, even though we see that he was from the area of Judah, he was of the southern kingdom, God is using him to prophesy specifically and mostly to the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. All right, so that's all introduction but I promise you're going to go through the main part pretty quickly, okay? Uh, but I wanted to set the scene for you guys. So let's jump down to chapter 3, verse number 1. Here we're going to see the sinning of Israel, the sinning of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm going to read quite a few verses here. So try your best to stay with me, all right? Here we go. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying... You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Right off the bat, we see that God is prophesying consequences for Israel's sin. And I love what he says here. You only, verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. What God is saying here is, hey, Israel, I have done nothing but bless you and take care of you and provide for you from the time you were brought out of Egypt to where I parted the Red Sea and then let come back on Pharaoh and his army from even when you sinned so you had to stay in the wilderness. I fed you in the wilderness with manna. When you complained about that, I even gave you quail. And then from there, I led you into the promised land and gave you some amazing battle victories between Ai and Jericho and all these other places. And you just keep on going. And what he's saying is, hey, You guys are my chosen people, but because of that, because I've invested so much into you, there's some issues that we need to get taken care of. And there's some consequences that are coming for your sin. And and we have to remember that God does bring consequences for sin. I think we often think, well, I'm saved, so, you know, don't have to worry about that. Well, yes and no. You don't have to worry about hell, thankfully, amen. You don't have to worry about a permanent consequence. Uh, but God does chasten whom he loves. Amen? And when we sin, God will correct it. It may not happen instantaneously. It may not happen even soon after. But just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're not going to get punished for your sins. Right? I mean, one of my favorite examples is when we get saved, you become a child of God. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think back to my early life. I know this is hard to imagine, but I was not the perfect kid, okay? I messed up every once in a while. Not not a lot, all right? But I did mess up every once in a while, and my parents would discipline me. Because I think parents should discipline their children. Amen. All right, there we go. Uh, (laughs) I'm I'm meddling now. I'll get off that. All right, anyways, I would be disciplined. But listen, what my parents never did is they never said, Joshua, you've messed up so much we're kicking you out of the house. That, that's what God does, amen? Once you're a child of him, that doesn't mean he's not going to discipline you, but thankfully, he's not going to kick you out of the house, all right? That, 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 that adoption that takes place, what Paul talks about, such a beautiful picture of adoption, how the Romans did adoption, it was a permanent thing, all right? In Roman adoption, once that, uh, that process took place, it could not be undone. All right? Research Roman adoption is really interesting. Uh, but anyways, that's what God does with us. Just because we're saved, he's not going to kick us out of the house, but it doesn't mean that he's not going to discipline us. All right? And that's important to remember. Uh, we look at verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And you say, that's an interesting saying. We hear that a lot. But look what he keeps going. 
Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? That word gin is just an old word for a trap. Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, we read these verses, and they're a little bit odd, okay? And what Amos really is doing here to make it super simple is he's asking a bunch of rhetorical questions, all right? And what he's coming down to is saying this, God ordains everything. God allows things to happen. God causes things to happen. The sin, all these things that were coming to Israel, the blessings that Israel happened, it was because of God. When they faced hard times, it was because God allowed it to happen, all right? Now, again, remember, just because God allows something to happen, okay, it doesn't mean that it's punishment necessarily, but in this case for the Israelites, it was punishment. God's about to have all these things happen to him, and he even says right there, he says he revealed his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That was the prophet's job. They were to go into Israel and say, hey, you guys are messing up. You need to make things right. We see this with Jonah going into the city of Nineveh, and he proclaimed for three days. He walked around the whole city for three days saying, hey, guys, y'all need to go ahead and repent because God is upset and you're going to be destroyed. And he did that for three days. Now, God, and his, again, his wonderful, amazing mercy and long suffering, chose not to destroy the city of Nineveh. Uh, and Jonah pitched a little fit about that, but that's a different story for a different day, all right? But that was the prophet's job, to call out these sins and to warn the people to basically be the mouthpiece of God, to tell the Israelites, to tell the people of Judah, and sometimes to tell other nations, like we saw last week with the Edomites, hey, this is what God's plan is for you. This is what's going to happen, and this is why it's going to happen. So we see that they're sinning here. Look at... Uh, where we're in verse 8, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? Publish in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces of the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, An adversary there shall be, even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Thus saith the Lord, as a shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs, or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus, in a couch. It's a really grisly picture, basically saying, hey, as there's little pieces of leftover when a predator comes and attacks a sheep or a lamb, all that's going to be left of Israel is little pieces here and there. It's a really sad, uh, grisly picture that Amos is painting here for us. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground, and I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. There's there's so many different things right here. Uh, I you know we could really spend all day on some of these things, all right? But I want to just sum a couple of things really really quickly. Uh, the first thing is we see that Israel was supposed to be the 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 one to tell the people around them that there is a God in Israel. And that he's watching over them. But what we read is that judgment is coming and God specifically is saying to do this. Publish it in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt. God is saying, hey, you guys were supposed to be a witness to me or, or for me in these places. I think of uh, a second, or excuse me, 1 Samuel 17, 46, it says this. When David was speaking to life, he said, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And here's what's happening. We're seeing the reverse of what David intended and what God intended for Israelites. 
Israel was supposed to be the ones to let everybody know, hey, there is a God in Israel. He is the almighty God. He is the one true God. Uh, it, it's not Baal. It's not Molech. It's not any of these other gods or goddesses. But hey, it is the God, Jehovah. And what God is saying here is, Israel, since you did not do that, what's going to happen is all these people are going to hear about your demise, and they're still going to get the message though, that there is a God, but he's done with Israel for now. All right? And that's, that's a big deal. And when we look through the rest of the Old Testament, you look through the rest of the minor prophets, God basically is done with Israel for a time. We move to the New Testament, we see the church, and the church is there, both the Gentile and the Jew. God is using us. Our responsibility is to tell the world that there is a God. Amen. And unfortunately, just like the Israelites, we often fail on that. But that's our responsibility. And Israel, even though they're still God's chosen people, he's not forsaken them. They don't really come back into a major play until the end times, really until the tribulation. And so there's a difference there. And God's saying, hey, this was my goal for you guys. You guys are failing on this. And guess what? People are still going to find out there's a God in Israel. And so God here is saying, you guys be ready because these consequences are coming. God specifically mentions in verse 14, the altars of Bethel. Now, Bethel is a beautiful, sometimes it's called Bethel. You can really say either one. It's a beautiful, beautiful name. Uh, it, it is the place where, of course, Jacob wrestled with God, right? Uh, it was a place um, that uh, it was really known as, as the house of God, is what Bethel means. Um, Gilgal, as we mentioned in just a second, is kind of in the same area, and all these things, they all, they all refer to what the Israelites would have known as places of memorial. They were places that God had done something great for them. All right? And what happened was, if you remember from my first sermon on this, Jeroboam and his rebellion had placed something in Bethel. Does anybody remember what he had placed there? Y'all didn't listen very well. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It was a golden calf. Thank you, Sasha, for listening, right? He had placed a golden calf there, and he'd also placed one in Dan as well. And the idea was, because he was worried that the Israelites were going to leave him and go back to Jerusalem to serve God, so he said, hey, let's put some golden calves, one in Dan, and one in Bethel, the place that was the house of God, became a house for that idol. And that's what they do. They would go and worship the golden calf there. And again, to me, it's just the most ironic thing. They chose the exact same thing uh, that, they, that they originally made when they came out of Egypt, and God got upset with them for that. But that's what they did again. They fell into that same old sin. And God here is very specific with pointing out and saying, hey, you know that idol down in Bethel? The, the one that's taking my house the place that's literally translated as house of God. Yeah, I'm going to go down there and look at what he says. And, and, and I will visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I think God's a little bit upset. Would we agree with that? Because God's upset with sin. And listen, the Bible is very clear that God is a jealous God. He is to be first place. And, and I'm really, really concerned for the church. And, and listen, I'm preaching myself as well because I'm guilty of this sometimes. That we often break that commandment to not have any other gods before him. Because what we do is we let a bunch of things come between us and God. And I see it. And I see it working with the teenagers. And, and unfortunately, I see sometimes parents encouraging this. I've, I've mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to parents for a second. Listen, school is important, but school is not more important than God. I love sports. I'm all for sports. Sports are great, but sports are not more important than God. Amen? And listen, I understand today's world, we have to work sometimes on Sunday, and many of you do, and you come when you can. I completely understand that, 100%. But even still, work can come in front of God if you're not careful. It can. Uh, there's so many things, TV and video games and shopping and money and cars and how. There's so many things that can become between and God, between me and God, and we're guilty. Even though we're not bowing down to a golden calf, we're breaking the same commandment that the Israelites are doing right here. And God does not want that. We've got to be careful about that. We move on to chapter 4. 
And it says, hear this word. It's, it's really just a continuation, even though it's a different chapter. He's still prophesying because he says, Be kind of Bashan, which are in, or excuse me, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. Now, really quickly, um, uh, let, let's read verse 2 and 3 real quick, and I'll, I'll talk about this. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And you shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which is before her, and you shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Now, right here, this is actually referring to a very specific group of people. I had no idea. I'd read this verse before, and it just sounds like a generic prophecy. This is actually being very, very specifically uh, referenced to a group of ladies that were very influential in the area. And um, this word kind is cows. And he is calling a bunch of ladies uh, that they're acting like cows. And you say, well, how do you know that? Uh, when it says, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink, that word masters in the Hebrew uh, is actually just referring to husbands. And so this was what God is saying here is, listen, because often what happens is, God places the emphasis on the man because the man's supposed to be the leader of the church and the man's supposed to be the leader of the home, right? But what he's saying here is, hey, now it's not even just the men that are guilty. It's also the ladies as well. They were causing just as much issues. And he's, he lays it out perfectly. He says, they're there. They're oppressing the poor. They're crushing the needy. And what they're doing is you're saying, hey, let's not worry about it. Let's just drink and have a good time. That's what he's saying. This area was known for its fruitfulness. In fact, uh, in other places, it refers to the bulls there of Bashan. It'd be like nowadays getting a steak and you know it's Angus beef, right? That's what they were known for. And so Amos here from God is using this word picture and he's saying, hey, you're enjoying your prosperity. You're enjoying really your, your fatness, your, your loveliness, how everything's perfect for you. You make fun of the poor. You don't help out the needy. In fact, you just say, let's not worry about them. Let's just drink some more. And guess what? It's not just the men. It's the ladies as well. And that's what he's saying right here. God is pointing out their sin. Look at verse 4. Come to Bethel and transgress. You say, wait a second. That's where the, that's where, that's where the, the, the golden calf is. Exactly. That Gilgal multiplied transgression. I mentioned earlier, Gilgal was a place of memorial where the stones were set up after the crossing of the Jordan River. It was a place where the children of Israel uh, were circumcised. And basically, Amos here is being very sarcastic. And he's saying, you guys have been doing this all along, so go ahead. Come to Bethel, come to the house of God and transgress. Come and sin. Come to Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, this is like you is what that's saying. O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. You see, this is, and I'm about to get off of this. This is what Israel's sin could be summed up as. They knew better. They did. These were the people that received all the commandments. The first five books of the Bible called them the Pentateuch, right? The Jews called them the Torah, the law. They knew that. They knew what was right. They knew what was wrong. They knew better, and yet they did not do it. Look at Amos 5.21 really quickly. Look what it says. I hate, I despise your feast days, the days that were supposed to be a day to glorify God. They've twisted them. I will not smell in your psalm assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. God is so done with it that he's saying, hey, I don't want your sacrifices anymore. I don't want your feast day anymore. In fact, he literally says, they stink to me. And listen, again, I'm afraid that we as Christians, we start twisting things. We don't do things the way that we should, and we make a show of things. And really all it does is it makes God sick. You say, how do you know that? Because it's repeated revelation where he says, hey, I'd rather you be hot or cold, not lukewarm. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out. Now, spew you out is a very nice way of saying that he's going to get sick. All right? And listen, that's the church today. That's the church. We're just like that. We, we put on such a good front, and we do, we know better. Because if you've been raised in church, you heard Bible story after Bible story, we know these stories. You say, I've not really read the Minor Prophets. You know what the Israelites did. You know they didn't serve God like they were supposed to. But yet we do the exact same thing. We do. And God's saying, hey, I'm done with this. I'm done. And here's what happens. James 4.17 says this, Therefore, to him 
that know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's when we say, oh me. Because it's really easy for us Christians to say, oh, well, you know what? I, I've never killed anybody, you know. I don't steal. I don't, I don't lie. I, I'm faithful to my husband, my wife. I obey my parents. But, and again, I'm, I'm saying, oh, me. Listen, I'm saying, oh, me here. This, this is to me, too. Please don't look up here and saying, I'm just preaching. I'm preaching myself. But when God says to witness to someone and we don't want to do it, guess what? According to that verse, it's sin. When we don't read our Bible and we know we're supposed to, according to that verse, it's sin. And I'm afraid that we as Christians, that's what we get into the habit of. We, we don't commit a bunch of going out and doing sins, but because we fail to do stuff, we're, we're still sinning. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They knew what to do. They knew what was to do right, and they just wouldn't do it. And here's what happens. Sin always, and I had this bold in my notes, sin always leads to suffering. Look at verse 6 with me. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and one of bread. What he's saying here is they have so little food that their teeth are literally clean. That's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, I tried to give you a famine to get it to your attention, but yet have you not returned to me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there was yet uh, three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet, have you not returned unto me, say the Lord. God's right here saying, guys, I'm trying to give you all the signs I can. I literally made it rain on one city and not on another to get your attention. And yet, we see this phrase repeated over and over. Look, let's keep going. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet, have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses. I have made the stink of your camps to come up into your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I tell you what, God right here, I can see it. I, I, can, I can almost envision it, and Amos being passionate here, saying, look, God has done time after time after time, tried to get your attention to get you to do right. And he sent you some terrible things to let you know, hey, I'm watching you. I want you to get right. I want you to get right with me. And yet, we see this phrase repeated multiple times, and yet, have you not returned unto me? And then we get to verse 12. Therefore, I'm done. That's what he's saying, therefore. Thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee. And to me, this is some scary words right here. Look at this, verse 12. Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he, the God that formeth the mountains, the God that created the wind, the God that declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, the God that treads upon the high place of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Hear ye this word, verse 1 of chapter 5, which I take up against you, even a lamentation of the house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. And that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek me, and ye shall live. We have all these bad things right here. Back to back to back. God, I've done this. God has done that. God has done this. God has done that. Trying to get Israel's attention. Trying to get Israel's attention. And they refuse to return unto him. And he says, hey, time's up. It's time for the consequences. And listen, Christian. Please don't ever get to that point. Please don't get to that point. The scary place to be where he says, hey, prepare to meet thy God. Now you say, this is, this is all really depressing. It is pretty depressing. But listen, it's applicable. And we need to be careful about this. 
But as we wrap things up, I want us to look at verse 4 again, because maybe you missed it the first time. I'm so thankful for this. Look at verse 4 again. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. Let's keep going. But seek not Bethel, nor enter to Gilgal, pass on to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. You know what I'm saying here? Don't look back at, at all these little, these little flimsy memorials. They're, they are important, but what you've done is you've turned them into something they're not supposed to be. All right? You turn them into something they're not supposed to be. So what you need to do is look at verse 6. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. It's as simple as that. And ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. The God who put the stars into heaven. The guy, this is talking about uh, the seven stars, also known as the seven sisters or Pleiades and Orion. They're still in the sky today. I love what it says. I mean, I'm, I'm blanking on where it is exactly. But it talks about when God made all things. It says very clearly just he made the stars also. The same God that spoke into existence, let there be light. He also made Pleiades and Orion, seven stars and Orion. That turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with the night. The one who controls everything, that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name that strengthened the spoil against the strong, so that the spoil shall come against the fortress. They hate him. That rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from him burdens of wheat, ye have built houses of hewn stone, but ye not, shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold, your many transgressions, and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they, just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore, the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time, Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good. And establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Right here to sum everything up, and I'm going to close this. I'm going to close on the positive, all right? All these things that have transpired. All of this sin that has taken place. And again, I've already said, I'm going to say it again. We are guilty of some of the same sins. We are. In a different manner, but we're, we're guilty of the same thing. The God of the universe. Oh, I, I like how specific Amos got there. I mean, they're the God who put the seven stars, Pleiades, Orion. That, that God, yes. That, the one that brings water onto that That God. Just make sure you know who we're talking about. Guess what? He does still love you, but you have to seek him. You have to follow after. You do. And, and if you read throughout the Minor Prophets, you see this same message over and over again. God is upset, and God is going to punish sin. Because that's who God is. God is holy. You know, we talk about merciful and long-suffering, all these things, and those things are true. But God is holy, and thus he cannot tolerate sin. He can't. It would literally go against who God is for him to tolerate sin. He wouldn't be, it's like, it's like an oxymoron, really. It's a conundrum. We, we really can't think about it because it's who God is. He just, he, he can't. So he is holy, and he has to judge sin. But we can seek the Lord. We can. We can seek him. We follow after his ways. As verse 15 said, do this. Hate the evil, love the good. Establish judgment in the gate, and it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Now listen, they still went into captivity. They did. But if you know how Revelation ends, God is gracious to the remnant. And he does save 12,000 from each tribe, adding up to 144,000. It's obvious, I think it's safe to say, somebody sought him. Now, again, we still have to face consequences for our sins. But God is merciful, and he does love you. And he wants, you know, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and it cleanses from all unrighteousness. We just have to make sure that we seek him, hate evil, and love good. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's all stand together. Pastor's going to come to front and 
Miss Susan, I'm going to come to the piano.